1947 in White Gold, southern Rhodesia, where his parents had emigrated from war-torn Europe after the Second World War. His mother was a doctor who built a network of rural clinics and raised three children, and his father was an engineer. Peter studied at Cambridge University and began working as a foreign correspondent for the Sunday Times and as a news correspondent for the BBC. The author of three books on his native country and co-author of a fourth, Peter's works have earned him global recognition as today's foremost international voice and chronicler of the true political and economic situation in present day Zimbabwe. <coughs> Peter's celebrated journalism career has seen him file reports from over 60 countries, including from wars in Africa, the Balkans, Kashmir, and elsewhere, and also from the last years of apartheid in South Africa. His 1996 autobiography, Mukiwa, A White Boy in Africa, won the George Orwell Prize and the Esquire Apple Waterstones Award. <coughs> Peter's most recent book on his native country, the one which brings us here today, is The Fear, Robert Mugabe, and the Martyrdom of Zimbabwe. And it describes in horrific detail the vicious and bloody efforts of Mugabe, the country's long-serving and failed leader, to maintain his grip on power following the disputed 2008 presidential election. Peter has taught writing as the Ferris Professor of Journalism at Princeton, as well as at the New School in New York City and Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. In 2010, he received the Guggenheim Fellowship awarded to men and women who have already demonstrated exceptional capacity for productive scholarship or exceptional creative ability in the arts. Peter resides in New York City with his wife, Joanna, and their two sons, Hugo and Thomas. It is our privilege and our great pleasure to host him here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Godwin. Are in retrospect 
time, it was all I knew. My mother, my mother, as, as has been alluded to, was um, was a bush doctor. Her, her her patients were 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 black tribesmen and women from a very rural, cut off area, and she ran leper colonies and tuberculosis sanitaria. Um, and it was an extraordinary time, really a time that I think, in retrospect, one our grandparents would recognise more than my generation. Um, when the war first started, the war against white rule, um, it was our next door neighbours who were the first victims of that war. They were they were murdered on a, at, at a <coughs> by a gang called the Crocodile Gang. Um, and in fact, somebody who worked for us, our cook, was suspected for some time of being connected with the perpetrators, which was as a sort of five-year-old I found fantastically exciting. Of course, his status in our household immediately shot up as far as I was concerned. Um, and I do remember in the way that, that children don't really have an overarching morality on these things, that when my mother attended that murder um, uh, of, of um, his name is Oberholzer, and his body was lying on the ground, um, and I was looking at it from a distance, I wasn't allowed out of the car, and I noticed that the knife that had been used to kill him was still in his chest. Um, and it was this most amazing knife, with sort of carved handle, a carved bone handle. And I was looking at this and eventually sidled up to my mother and realizing that even at that tender age that I had to <coughs> try and couch this in somewhat diplomatic terms, asked her if perhaps when they all finished with the crime scene and they no longer had any use for the knife, that maybe I could, I could have it. Um, and it didn't go down very well, as you can imagine. It went into an evidence bag and I hadn't seen it again. But that's just really to give you the impact that that's what happens when you grow up in extraordinary times. To you as a kid, this is, this is normal, because this is, you, you really don't have another context. But it was extraordinary in, in other ways, too. I mean, if you think about the so-called white tribe of Africa, which I'm, it, as I get older and with, with, with hindsight myself and, and indeed distance, both geographic and chronological, um, I, I think that, that there really was no such thing. But, I mean, that perhaps whites in Africa never really achieved critical mass anywhere, even, even in South Africa. But it's an extraordinary sort of hybrid group of people who, although, like me, I was born in Africa, and, and there are, there are many whites who are fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation Africans. It's an odd hybrid culture. At Christmas, we send each other Christmas cards with snow and reindeer and holly and things that we've never seen. Um, uh, and so it's, it's, it's sort of a, a peculiar, peculiar culture. In its dying days in the 1970s, I was conscripted. Um, I spent two years in the war and then finally got out to go to Cambridge. And I was one of those who came back, we were good so-called white liberals, who came back in 1980 when Robert Mugabe took power in Zimbabwe because we believed, because we thought that what we could do is create a multiracial society that would be a sort of beacon of tolerance um, and, and show really the rest of Africa and indeed the world what, what could be done and how you could overcome a history um, history of hatred, a history of, of racism, a history of violence. And initially, it looked quite promising. And certainly, if you read the conventional uh, press, if you, if, you, if, you read, if you go back and read what was being said about it at the time, um, everybody is hopeful about Zimbabwe at the time. Um, it gets very good press. And Mugabe himself, as I said, is seen with a, as, with a kind of, as, as giving a pre-Mandela type speech. He was enormously reconciliatory to whites who lived in Zimbabwe. They all thought they were gonna to have to leave, including the white farmers. And instead, he, he asked them to stay. Um, he gave an amazing speech shortly after he came to power in which he specifically addressed the white community and asked them to stay, and in particular, the white farmers. Which is important to remember given what happened to them later. I and mean, in some ways, I think that with that speech, what you had was a sort of redrawing of the social contract and saying, don't leave, which most of them would have done, but stay and contribute to New Zimbabwe and go out and grow food and, and earn foreign currency 
Um, and then Zimbabwe is seen as being very successful during the 1980s and really through most of the 1990s, uh, even as other African countries are uh, falling into civil war, they're, they're failing to grow, in fact their, their economies are contracting. Zimbabwe did better and better until it got to a point where by far it had the most educated <laughs> population in Africa. It had something like 93-94% um, literacy rate. Um, it had, it had this, you know, and, and that has always been Zimbabwe's biggest asset, um, its, its people. Um, and it, it was seen as a success story. Now, in the late 1990s, what, what happens, according to this orthodox view of the country, is that Mugabe, now getting elderly, um, he's ditched his first wife, he's married a woman 30 years, his junior, um, and he has a sudden rush of blood to the head and becomes the dictator that we all love to hate now, that we all recognize as the kind of arch villain, um, almost sort of you know, two-dimensionally so. Which is, which is a nice, neat trajectory that would fit into our kind of three-act Hollywood movie view of how these things happen. Unfortunately, there's just one little problem with it, it bears almost no relation to what actually happened. Um, which is that, and, and this is something that I recognized early on, not because I was so um, advanced and intelligent and was able to see things which others weren't, but simply by happening, which was that, in 19, after the country became independent in 1990, very shortly after that, Mugabe um, falls out with the southern tribe, the Indabele, who he sees as being a challenge, a threat. And he sends down into the southern province of Matabili land his North Korean trained 5th Brigade. And when they finished with the southern province, they had killed probably about 20,000 civilians. Nobody knows how many exactly because there's never been inquiry, there's never, no one's ever been allowed to actually look into it in any sustained forensic way. And I happened to be a sort of rookie reporter at the time. Um, I had been a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, and I had represented a number of the southerners who had been accused of high treason. And we got them all off in court, but they'd then been rearrested. Um, and as a result, I basically resigned from the bar and become a journalist. And I went down to Matsubila and saw firsthand what was happening. And this was, we were barely three years into independence at that point. And I realized exactly what we were dealing with here. And after that, there was a period where Zimbabwe was effectively a one-party state. So what we, what we have with Mugabe, what I realized then, and I think has been confirmed by what he's done later, is that he's been absolutely consistent as a leader, insofar as his, his MO, his modus operandi, has been that when he is faced with serious political challenges, he responds with violence. And you can see that in the early um, leadership struggles within his own his own group, Zanu PF now. You can see that in the very first elections in 1980, the very first one-man, one-vote elections in Zimbabwe, where the various different armies and guerrilla groups were all supposed to pull back into bases to demilitarize the, the electoral field. And they did, except for Mugabe's guerrilla group. And he, left, he left several thousand of his most experienced guerrillas out in the field, and they went around to the electorate and said, listen, these elections are simple. You vote for us or our luta continua, the struggle continues, the war goes on. The interesting thing with that is it's almost certain that Mugabe would have won those first elections very easily. Um, so I don't think the fact that those guerrillas were in the field did necessarily that much to distort the results. But what it does very early on is show you that here is a man who is more interested in power than in democracy. Now, insofar as democracy yields you power, you might say that that doesn't really make much difference. But where it becomes crucial, where that distinction becomes crucial, is when an electorate gets tired of you and wants to dispense with you and vote you out. And then you start to see the real difference whether you really were a Democrat at heart or someone just seeking power. And I think that what the army has I hope to show you is very much, um, very much the latter. Through the 1980s, 
um, and, into the, and, and most of the 1990s, Zimbabwe becomes effectively a one-party state. And many of the institutions that are so important to keep a democracy healthy um, are either not, not really established, or insofar as they're even notionally established, they wither on the vine and they die. And it, all, all independent means of controlling the government essentially um, um, wither during this period. And in the late 1990s, when the electorate does try to get rid of Mugabe, he reacts once again, as, as he always does, with, with violence. Um, and that's what happened in, uh, that, that's what happens um, in 2008, for example, at the elections that, that he loses and rejects. And that's what this book is essentially about. Um, by that point, at that point, really, from 2000 onwards, as the economy starts to unravel, um, because there really is an opposition now, and Mugabe is, is repressing them. Uh, Zimbabwe becomes a bellwether for Africa in a new and sinister way, insofar as it becomes this token of what it is like to be a failed state. It becomes the fastest contracting peacetime economy that anyone has ever seen. <coughs> um, the, the, the economy um, shrinks at a fantastic rate, following um, the land invasions of white farmers uh, following the collapse in food supply um, and, and also following hyperinflation. Um, let me give you let me give you a brief um, a brief taste of how bad of how bad Zimbabwe had become on this verge of the 2008 elections. These were these were elections which I had been asked uh, by a magazine called Vanity Fair to go back and cover because there was this dizzying moment where it seemed that Mugabe um, had lost them, that they had spun out of control. And in the run-up to the elections, these are the reasons that Zimbabweans had to reject Mugabe. <coughs> they have many reasons to reject him. Once they enjoyed the highest standard of living in Africa, now their money is nearly worthless, halving in value every 24 hours. Only 6% of workers have jobs. Their incomes have sunk to pre-1950 levels. They are starving, their schools are closed, their hospitals collapsed, their life expectancy has crashed from 60 to 36. They have the world's highest ratio of orphans. They are officially the unhappiest people on earth, and they are fleeing the shattered country in their millions, an exodus of up to a third of the population. But throughout the election campaign, Mugabe has remained belligerently unrepentant, blaming the country's ills on the West, Britain, the former colonizer in particular, and using the tiny number of whites remaining in Zimbabwe as political piñatas. He thwacks them and outpour the stale bonbons of historic blame to excuse his own shattering failure of leadership, his own rampant megalomania. Now, Mugabe is an interesting kind of dictator insofar as that's what he morphed into, um, which I believe he did, insofar as um, he's not really like an Idi Amin or these sort of, um, these stereotypical thuggish dictators. He's not some Nigerian general with medals, Ruritanian medals strewn across his, his chest. He's, he's oddly fastidious, he's very, uh, he, he's very conscious of wanting to keep up the appearance of democracy. He wants to keep the moral high ground or the perception of it. And I think when he looks in the mirror, that's still what he sees, notwithstanding what he's done. I think that, he, so for example, he still has elections, whereas people like Idi Amin just dispensed with those and didn't even bother. Mugabe still <coughs> wants to keep within the letter of the law. A bit like Bloomberg in New York when he ran out of term limits, he changed the constitution. But in, Z in Zimbabwe, um, in Zimbabwe, that we 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 we, we lit the way on that as well. We changed the constitution several times so that Mugabe could, could stay in power. But he still has the elections, but they tend to be fiddled. I think it was was it Stalin who said it's not it's not who votes that matters, it's who counts the votes. Um, and in Zimbabwe, who counts the votes uh, is very definitely um, in, in in Mugabe's camp. But in two thousand in two thousand and eight, a strange thing happened, which is that 
his party's RPF, his, his election workers and his people in the field, um, they, they underestimated the, the extent to which the people had rejected Mugabe. They, just, they, they thought they were dealing with a much smaller percentage of rejection than they were, especially in their own heartlands. And they literally didn't stuff the ballot <coughs> boxes with enough fake votes, and they just got it slightly wrong. I mean, even in the places they did, there are some, there are some very um, amusing results. People often say how, um, how, how uh, sophisticated Mugabe's um, tactics are, but in reality, they aren't. I mean, I, I went to polling stations where the tactics, for example, were simply to switch the opposition's votes with Mugabe's votes, to just, just move, move one, from, one from one column to the other. Or another one where their very sophisticated method was to add a zero to all Mugabe, the column of Mugabe's votes, even when this turned out to mean that Mugabe's the, the Mugabe's column, the column of votes for him, exceeded the total number of votes that had, been, had gone into that particular polling station. Um, it didn't take, it, it, you didn't need the UN to show that this was a, this was a deeply flawed and fraudulent election. Um, and, and as a result, it, 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 at the end of it, the margin um, by which the opposition had won, um, Morgan Shangarai, the opposition leader, was so great that um, that, that, that it was going to kick at the very least into a second round, but actually Morgan Shangarai had, had won outright. And for a dizzying two or three weeks, it looked like Mugabe, who was by then I think already 83 or 84, was just suddenly he looked tired, he looked as though uh, he, was, he was done for, and it looked like he was going to step down. And it was in that dizzying window that I was sent there, essentially to dance on Mugabe's political grave, something that I was more than happy to do. Um, uh, and they were putting together exit packages. I saw them, I mean, the, the American <coughs> ambassador, the British ambassador, the, the foreign, community, foreign diplomats in general, putting together exit packages for Mugabe and his generals to try the so-called soft landing so that he would leave and so that the country could really get on with its future. And it, it looked like it would work. So I went there in, in that little window. And in the end, instead of standing down, Mugabe, Mugabe listened to his generals and decided that he would stay. And so they went into a second round. But before they announced that, they set off on this most extraordinary, um, most extraordinary campaign of violence against their own people. They effectively declared war on their own population. And it, I've never seen anything like it, and I've covered a lot of wars, and I've covered um, a lot of um, violence around the world, but I've never seen anything quite like it for its, its deliberateness, for the way that this, this wasn't anarchy, this wasn't some kind of, you know, Liberian boy soldier, Sierra Leonean out of control thing. This, this, this was much more, it, you know, in a, in a weird way, it wasn't even like Rwanda, which, when the word went out, people killed their neighbors. It was done at a sort of grassroots level. This was hierarchical. This was much more redolent of fascism in that it was, there were orders, there were lists of names. It was very, very deliberate um, um, and, 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 and very, very organized. And there was something particularly chilling about that. Um, and I was with my sister. My sister had, had, had come back to the country at the same time, and we were still waiting for the results of the first round to be announced and didn't know what was happening. And we went back to where I grew up in the Eastern Highlands, this most beautiful part of Zimbabwe, which actually, weirdly, looks not unlike parts of Vermont. Um, very green and verdant and mountainous. Um, doesn't look at all like the, the stereotype you might have in your minds of Africa, very well watered, with orchards and um, plump cattle, um, coffee, tea, that kind of thing. Uh, and on the way back to the capital, Harare, um, we started to see off the side of the main road um, people being pushed in wheelbarrows. Now, Zimbabwe had known by then it almost run out of fuel, and there was a huge crisis in public transport, amongst many, many other things. And Georgina made a joke about how you know, that was now the local <coughs> taxi service that you kind of you hired a guy and pushed 
you know, we know that's, how, that's how bad it had got. And we saw this several times. And then when I got back to Harare, we started hearing reports of, of the odd person turning up, starting turning up in ones and twos and threes in the hospitals, the private hospitals, because the government hospitals had collapsed, with terrible wounds um, and having come and having and claiming to have been tortured. And I started to go to the hospitals to see what was what was going on. Um, and it turns out that those people we saw, usually in the gloaming, just about twilight, were the first torture victims being um, carried back by their relatives from these torture bases that the that Mugabe and his men had established, mostly in, in schools which had stopped working. Um, and what they did was the plan was that rather than again, this is this 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 was somewhat sophisticated in a, in, a, in a chilling way, is that Mugabe realizes that if he kills thousands and thousands and thousands of people, he triggers that can, gets over the international threshold for some kind of intervention or some UN U, U, condemnation of the UN. So rather than do that, what he wanted to do was terrify people, but without bringing some kind of foreign intervention. So they had lists of opposition members, and they brought them all into these schools these torture bases, where they would torture them for days and days on end, and the women were raped, and men were terribly badly beaten, as were the women. Um, and, but then after several weeks, in some cases, they were, that they, were, they would be set free. So it was done to use an angling term on a catch and release basis. These people were brought in, beaten to within an inch of their lives, and then released to go back to their home communities, where they acted as essentially as human billboards, as advertisements for what happens to you if you have the temerity to oppose the regime. Um, and they would, and when they went back to their home villages, um, they set off ripples of alarm in those, and, and anxiety in those communities, and people were, to, people were indeed terrified. <coughs> I want to read you a little, a little extract from one of my first trips to a hospital in Harare, when I first, when I read, started to realize what was happening. White man's flesh marks easily. It is a pale canvas on which the path of pain is easily painted. But it takes a lot more to mark a black man. Somehow the palette of black wounds seems more violent, tearing down through the dark skin into the yellow curd of subcutaneous fat, the red bristle of muscle fiber, down to the shocking whiteness of bones. In Ward 1S, we catch up with Dr. Korik, a Yugoslav orthopedic surgeon who has never been so busy. What he is seeing mostly now is what he calls defense injuries. It's a chilling phrase, one the doctors use to describe the shattering damage caused to your arms when you hold them up over your head in an effort to protect yourself from the blows. The blows of the boot, the blows of the log, the blows of the whip, the blows of the rock, the machete. Now Dr. Corrick has run up <coughs> with metal plates and pins he uses to, to set shattered arms and legs so he can no longer operate other than to clean up the shards of bone. He doesn't know what else to do. I can't just discharge someone with fractured tibias, he says, head in hands. In Ward 1S2 are Happiness, happiness Mutata and C. Mutikele. Nurse Georgie goes to their bed ends and takes a quick look at their charts, comparing them against her book. Happiness has a fractured right leg and a fractured right arm, and no plates or pins, so neither bone is set yet. If they start to mend, then Corrick will have to break them again and reset them. They are PEV victims too. The pace of the terror is so fast now, we are distilling it down to acronyms. PEV, post election violence. In bed 1SI is Grace Gambeza from Munzi. She's 29. She has septic hematoma on her back and buttocks and fractured arms. DW says the child. <coughs> she also has a tiny baby that is still breastfeeding. The nurse brings her in, a bundle wrapped in a white hospital sheet, and tries to hold her to Grace's breast to feed. With two broken arms, Grace cannot hold her baby to her own breast. It is one of the saddest things I've seen. Grace weeping silently, her broken, unset arms lying uselessly at her sides. 
as the nurse holds the crying baby to her breast and tries to get it to feed. The nurse looks up from her patient log, shakes her head, blinks rapidly, and takes off her glasses, pretending to clean them. Then, not trusting herself to talk, she turns on her heel and marches off to the next patient. Bed after bed, in ward after ward, on floor after floor, is filled with Mugabe's victims, a hospital full of those he has injured, tortured, and burned out of their homes. As I shuffle between the torture victims, moving from bedside to bedside, long after Georgie has left, and on my return to bedsides here and in other clinics, copiously noting down the details of their experiences, I feel helpless, frustrated, and angry. I'm not sure what I can do to help. My role is unclear to me. I wish there were a better word than victims to describe what these people are. It seems so inert, so passive and weak, and that is not what they are at all. There is dignity to their suffering, even as they tell me how they have fled, how they have hidden, how they have been humiliated and mocked. There is little self-pity here. Survivors, I suppose, defines them better. Again and again, as I place stenographer to their suffering, I offer to conceal their names or geographical districts to prevent them being identified. But again and again, they volunteer their names and make sure I spell them correctly. They are proud of their roles in all of this, at the significance of their sacrifice, and they want it recorded. I shrink from generalizing what they have gone through, because it can feed into that sense that this is some undifferentiated, amorphous mass of third world peasantry, some generic, fungible freeze of suffering, one that animates briefly as you intersect with it, rubbernecking at it, a drive-by misery that disappears as you motor away over the horizon. And for the first time, in trying to work out why I am here and whether it is constructive, I find myself settling on a phrase that I had always avoided, a description that I had found pretentious, but that now seems oddly apt, bearing witness. I'm bearing witness to what is happening here, to the sustained cruelty of it all. I have a responsibility to try to amplify the suffering, the sacrifice, so that it will not have happened in vain. I feel too like a prompt at a play. After dozens of hours of this, I often know now, before they speak, what they will say next. I didn't write the words, nor can I change them, but I know what they'll be because I have heard them before, because there are so many who have been through this torture factory, and that's what it is. It is abuse on an industrial scale, with the torturers following a script handed to them from above. There is no spontaneity to this evil. It is ordained from the top. It is hierarchical, planned, and plotted. Mugabe's men have even given it a name. They call it Operation Ngati Pedze Navo. Let us finish them off. And just as Operation Gokura Hundi, which I had witnessed in Matabililand all those years ago, was an operation to shatter <coughs> the structure of an opposition party, so this one has the same aim. Two operations separated by nearly 25 years, but apparently nothing has changed. Beneath Mugabe's spurious air of correctness, this is the bloody reality. These shattered limbs and broken lives. This, quite simply, is the base upon which the tyrant's power ultimately rests, and it is one of fear. <clears throat> now, the other aspect of this book um, which was written over a period of two years, is really concerns us in this room in the sense that one knows, intellectually one knows this stuff is happening, one might see it on the news, one might read it in the papers, but there's a kind of sense of helplessness that, that can set it, because after all, what can any one of us do anywhere? I mean, it's just one of those things. And it's also very difficult, I think, coexisting with these various scenarios in your head simultaneously. You have your actual life, your everyday life, the life you live, and then you have this other world. And for me in particular, I started to become kind of schizophrenic. I had this, this one life over there where I was seeing things and I was shuttling back and forth. And then I had this 
another life that would be much more recognizable to you where I lived in New York with a family and kids at school and trying to sort of you know, go to different parties and do what everybody does. And um, towards the end of it, it became increasingly difficult for me to somehow give headspace to both these worlds. Um, and I just want to give you a little taste of this because I think it's, to some extent, it's what all of us uh, wrestle with to a greater or lesser extent. <coughs> Excuse me. When I return, I struggle to compartmentalize my life. Shaken by what I have seen in Zimbabwe, I'm acutely grateful that my family is safe here in New York, that we aren't awoken by the shattering of glass, the reek of kerosene and the room in flames, that we don't have to run out into the night carrying our sons, pursued by Mugabe's henchmen. But I feel guilty and ineffectual too, maudlin and distracted and angry. I find myself trembling for no reason, getting flashbacks to the parade of torture victims that lines the halls of my memory. Though I am no longer there to witness it, their misery continues. I want to hug my sons to me now, spend all my time with them. They can sense something changed in me. <coughs> I'm them newly back, I'm playing with them on the bedroom floor. Hugo and I are defending a wooden fort of small plastic dinosaurs. Thomas is attacking us with large US soldiers. The rallying cry of our army of diminutive dinos is, we may be small, but we are many. To which Thomas's giant GIs retort, we may be few, but we are large. In the middle of the game, I reach to move a little T-Rex, and suddenly I see the little boy, Samson Chamarani, lying in hospital with his eye hanging out, and the T-Rex picture that the nurses had taped to his medical chart to cheer him up. The truth about killer dinosaurs, said the caption. What is, asks Hugo, what is the truth about killer dinosaurs? Without realizing it, I have spoken aloud. I haven't told the boys much about Zimbabwe this time, nor have I shared the details with Joanna, who is just back from the Paris collections. When two worlds collide, I joke, couture versus torture, she suggests that I may be suffering from some form of PTSD by proxy. Now I tell Hugo a diluted version of Samson's story, how I met a little boy in Zimbabwe who had been hurt. But Hugo is at an inconstantly curious age. He wants more detail. Did he cry, he demands? Yes. Can you run out of, can you run out of tears, he segues. I draw breath to answer, but he's already serially speculating. Do you have a little reservoir where tears are stored and when it's empty you can't cry anymore? How does it fill up? Where do tears come from anyway? What are they made of? Did Alice really swim through her own tears in Wonderland? That night he comes into our bedroom and tears himself. He has been awoken by a bad dream. I was kidnapped by a man in a snake suit, he sniffs. You've upset him with your war stories, Joanna chides. But then I woke up, says Hugo, rallying and I realized that it was just a fake life. A fake life. Maybe that's what I'm living. But which is my real life and which is my fake one? Zimbabwe seems so real when I'm there, but even while I'm there, I'm not really. Soon I leave and it fades into my past again. It reminds me of working as a foreign correspondent, shoulder to shoulder with photographers and cameramen, how they become so integrated with their cameras they feel they aren't really there in the flesh. You have to hurry them away as the danger grows. Hugo's bad dream, his first in ages, has come because his dream catcher is full, he reckons. His sleep used to be stalked by a malign character he calls the Fat Lady, who taunted him and threatened him, though it didn't appear to, to do him actual bodily harm. But the bad dream stopped once he made us buy him a Mohawk dream catcher from a farm stand in Green County in the Catskills. He hung it on his bedside light from its leather thong, a suede-bound willow ring with indigo beads strung on a twine web within it, and feathered tassels twirling slowly below, and the fat lady went on sabbatical. My dream catcher needs to be empty, he announces now. You have to shake it over running water. Apparently, you can't just release bad dreams into the air, or they will escape <coughs> to plague someone else. It's like Ghostbusters, he says, 
the way they have to store the captured ghosts in that special tank. So we walk down to the Hudson River and solemnly empty his bad dreams into the fast olive water. I wish it were that simple. I wish that I could commit all the horrifying images and stories, things that will live with me forever now, into the dark currents as they slide swiftly under the twisted metal hulk of the old New York Railroad Pier and have them borne away past Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty and out into the gelid grey sea. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So I think that that's been part of the problem in Zimbabwe, is that the opposition there have constantly made appeals to SADAC, to the African Union, to various um, African organizations, asking for help, and that help hasn't come. Um, the SADAC has been a little more assertive of late, but I think it's mostly playing to the gallery. I don't think that they've really got the, um, the muscle or the temperament or, or the motivation to do anything. Now, part of that, part, part of the reason for that is that you know, if you're in, if you if you live in a glass house, you don't throw stones. And there are many, many of Africa's 50 odd countries that are themselves um, not real democracies. I mean, more than half of them. And so they don't feel like either criticizing or indeed being criticized for for lack of democracy. So that's been part of the problem. But there again, when the Zimbabwe opposition have turned to the international community, saying, "Help us! Here we are. We're a democratic movement. We've remained non-violent." haven't picked up weapons, um, we need help. Um, and they have, they, have, they have not found that help in the international community at all. I mean, there are these token sanctions against Zimbabwe, but, but really nothing more. And I think the reason for that is that Zimbabwe lacks um, the, the, the two or three essential exports that trigger um, uh, international intervention. And those exports would be oil, international terrorism. And if you don't export either of those, you're not really strategic. So unless your humanitarian um, problem really sort of, you know, so vast, then you, you don't really get much help. Would you please give us a very brief uh, characterization of Morgan Svengerai, uh, Mugabe's chief political opponent, and explain why Svangarai and uh, his party remained for so long in the power sharing agreement with Mugabe's Sanu PF, which seemed strange in light of what was happening to them. Uh, for those of you, uh, for those of you who don't know what we're referring to, in, in, in 2009, um, that this power share agreement came in, which is a kind of supposed to be a transitional period during which the opposition and Mugabe's party cohabits in government. They share out the ministerial portfolios while a whole, uh, a whole a raft of reforms are brought in, freedom of the media, reform of the, of the electoral process, etc., etc., and prepare the way for a real election, you know, probably in 2012, 2013. Um, but this has been going on, we were now two years into, more than two years into the so-called government of national unity. And um, many people, I mean, I mean, you, for example, and, and, and myself as well, have been very critical of this because not much has happened by way of these uh, reforms. And Mugabe still very much is in the driving seat and has kept all the ministries that really matter, the, the hard security ones, defense and those uh, sort of things to himself. Um, the reason that Morgan Shangirai, the leader of the opposition, gives for having gone into, it, uh, gone into this agreement in the first place are, were essentially humanitarian. Uh, that the country was, was really imploding very, very rapidly, and people were dying in great numbers. Um, the thing, you know, that, that, that there, are, there are more ways to commit a genocide than, than in the ones that achieve um, international attention. In Zimbabwe, there were these quiet, unheralded deaths going on all over the countryside, people starving, people already who had a, a very high incidence of HIV and AIDS, who have compromised immune systems in the first place, and who die very quickly of things like cholera, um, and indeed starvation, malnutrition. Um, so, and, and, and with very few actual statistics, um, you know, in Zimbabwe is quite, quite possibly lost millions of people at this and the opposition really were faced with a choice in 2009, and it was a pretty stark one. And that choice was either to take up arms and to, to turn this whole thing into a, into a military confrontation, which they would almost certainly have lost, at least in the short and medium term, because they wouldn't have a base contiguous to the country, which is really what you need if you're going to launch a guerrilla movement. Um, and also, the, the opposition, I think, in Zimbabwe didn't have the appetite to do that. Zimbabwe, in general, having been through this very long, drawn-out guerrilla war to achieve 
has very little appetite to go back there. That, that there's still a kind of communal memory of what that was, and people are just they, they don't want to go there again. So they so they decided really under very very strong pressure from South Africa in particular, the opposition decided it would go in. So the, the South Africans basically told them if you don't go in, you can forget about any help from, from us at all. This is this is the only way forward. And they held out various promises that if they did go in, it would be a very temporary thing, it would be short-lived, it would just be a transit towards full democracy. And as you as you rightly say, I think that what's ended up happening, what I fear with that from the beginning, is that they've they haven't been co-opted exactly, but what, what, what it's done is given a lifeboat to Mugabe. It's extended, it's allowed Mugabe to extend his power beyond when, when he would have, um, the regime, and indeed the country would have collapsed. But in a weird way, it's a necessary collapse to allow, um, <coughs> to, 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 to a, you know, you've got to the bottom before you can change. So at the moment, we're in a very strange state in Zimbabwe. We're in this kind of twilight world where we haven't moved to the new, it's not a democracy yet. Mugabe's still in power, but he's not completely unchecked. So it's a it's a it's a very strange situation, I think, and one that can't last much longer. There are there is a new built end to it. There have to be elections, but the problem is that the the, the, the um, these reforms that are supposed to be in place before the elections are not all there. In fact, very few. Thank you. 
My question comes from a little different perspective. I recall hearing Bill Clinton, former president, say his most sorrowful hour was uh, his failure to support uh, Romeo Dallaire, uh, the UN force commander in Rwanda in 93, 94. So there were, and it wasn't just uh, Clinton who failed, it was Kofi Annan, Boutros, Boutros Ghali, and the entire uh, civilized world. Uh, and uh, I ask you, uh, rather than looking to uh, the UN or, or the African uh, allegiances, as someone who lives in America, you might be in America now, uh, I feel very hopeful that our leadership has the ability to recognize this extreme evil where oil or weapons of mass destruction may not be holding up humanity in limbo, but this is a known uh, a killer of uh, tens of thousands. How do you feel about the use of American uh, special forces units uh, to be deployed and, in fact, uh, uh, assassinate someone like uh, Ogawa. I'm being very forthright in using that uh, politically incorrect notion. You're welcome. Um, uh, I mean, I think there's, there's very little appetite in America for that kind of intervention in general, although I have to say in the last few days what we've seen is um, the deployment of at the moment, only a hundred special forces in an advisory role uh, to to counteract the, the, an outfit called the Lord's Resistance Army. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It's just a very bizarre cult group that operates now in the Central African Republic, Congo, Southern Sudan, and abducts school children. One thing's been going on for years. Um, uh, so, so that's quite a brave thing to do, I think, for the Obama administration in the current political climate, where I think you know, we're, we're almost out of Iraq, we're drawing down Afghanistan and win or lose, we want out of these places. There's very little appetite. We're looking at spending cuts and things to, to get involved in new, in new conflicts in, in general. I think also you know, there is a great difficulty in, in how these things happen. I mean, if it happens at all, it really has to come through and I think that's the way it's got to go. And, and there's really very little like, likelihood that China or Russia, both of them um, um, representatives on the Security Council, would ever agree. And even in South Africa, when it was, had the rotating position on the Security Council, kiboshed even a, a strong recommendation <coughs> of Mugabe at, at, at the time. So, I mean, I think that realistically that's not how, that's just not how it's going to happen. And, you know, normally what we do is when we when we want to when we want to go into a country for strategic reasons, we dress it up in humanitarian ones for what you know that's how we how we do it. But when there I mean one of the interesting things about Rwanda, for example, was that there was a dual narrative coming out of Africa that was as polarized as you could possibly get at the time, which is that on the one hand Mandela was being released and South Africa was becoming independent, there was this incredibly good news story at the bottom of the continent, and on the other you were having this, you know, appalling thing going on um, um, in, in the Great Lakes region. Uh, so, you know, trying to, trying to bring off um, that kind of intervention in real time is still incredibly difficult when you have to get it through a bureaucracy like the UN. It's incredibly difficult. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shalisa. I'm from Rwanda. I'm from So things have got pretty exciting in, in Zimbabwe in terms of you know how it plays out. Even I mean, if there is a, a, a free and fair elections, because one of the problems with with Zanu PF, interesting is one tends to look at these situations very sort of, as a, just a polarity, and it's a lot more than that. Zanu PF has got issues of its own. One of the things it's got is that you know if you're faced with a you've got a what is he now 88. 87, 88 year old leader, albeit you know, he's been relatively fit and whatever, now he's, he's, he's not in particularly good health, but his mother lived to be a great age. We've got 
president of Hastings Manda from Malawi who lived until, I think he said he was 90 when he, he was supposed to be 90 when he died, but I think he was actually 100, and so, and he was still in office. So, you know, sitting around waiting for Mugabe to die can be an extremely long game even now. Um, but one of the things about the dictators is that the, the, the hubris involved is that they don't want to um, accept their own mortality, in, 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 which is a sine qua non for just devising uh, deciding on a successor. I mean, if you had a problem, imagine that you was on a PF and you're sitting here with Mugabe and you, you, you want your party to stand power. Imagine for a moment that you go to you know, McKinsey's or something and say, hello, we're a little Central African country and we've got a problem with you know, Zimbabwe Inc. and we want you know, Zana PF to stay as the majority shareholder and how do you do this? And, like, and they look at the problem and they say, well, here's what you do. At the moment, Zimbabwe is a brand to Mugabe. I mean, Zana PF is a brand to Mugabe. That's what you've got. That's, he's the guy, he's the sort of font of legitimacy. He's the person that everybody knows. He's the only leader Zimbabwe has ever had since independence. So it's, it's, there's a cult of personality. It's the same kind of thing you see, say, in North Korea, but there it's like a monarchy you hand it on to your son. But in Zimbabwe, Mugabe's sons at the moment are still too young, although one of them actually is starting to be talked about, but, but um, so you never, you never know. But you've had these various countries <coughs> within Zan and PF vying to fill Mugabe's shoes, and what, what happens is that every time one of them seems to get ahead, it's Emerson Monagagwa or Joyce or you know, one of them, then Mugabe does something to destabilize them, to push them down so that none of them feel that they can you know, really um, um, threaten them. But the problem with that is that he has, he has no obvious successor. Now, you sense what he really should be doing, what McKinsey's would tell him to do is find the person you want to fill your shoes and then you know, give that person your imprimatur and say, this is my guy, and, you know, and, 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 and not, not to listen to Medford F way, but in a real way, you know? and that you, and that that person then starts to sort of speak with your authority, almost sort of, you know, starts off maybe as a ventriloquist dummy, but eventually sort of becomes the, the leader in his own right, and then when you die, that handover is sort of already been done. But that's not what's happening within Zimbabwe at all. And recently, as you referred to, um, one of the main contenders uh, was Joyce Mujuru, um, and her husband, who used to be the, the general of army in Zimbabwe died um, under very, very curious circumstances, which everybody in Harare is convinced was an assassination. He died in a house fire uh, and was burned literally to ashes, to cinders, and yet the fire appeared to be contained in, to an area about 12 feet around him. The rest of the house was untouched, and there were four or five easy exits unlocked within several strides away from so, so the, the strange things have been going on, and I think the difficulty that Zan and PF faces is that one of the things over the years that it's done is that it has allowed its internal democracy to atrophy. And the problem is that, you know, at a certain, you know, you do need, um, you do need young people coming up. You do need, you, you need people in a position um, to 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 fill the, the leadership positions. And as it, its future becomes less and less um, uh, guaranteed. I think that that's hard <coughs> to do as its patronage um, um, it gets diluted even during this um, government of uh, national unity. But I don't count it out by any means yet. I mean, the WikiLeaks stuff that has been coming out about Zimbabwe is also fascinating because what you discover is that everybody in the ruling party has been cycling through the American embassy, all ratting each other out. I mean, it's extraordinary. Mind you, a lot of the opposition have been doing the same. It's just, Everybody goes there to whine about other people and to, 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 to kind of sell the rumors on each other. It's an extraordinary thing to read. But I do think the serious point, though, my, 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 one of my last answers, I think, we're supposed to finish in a second, um, is that much as one longs to see the back of a dictator, the death of a dictator is a time of enormous...